we're going to begin and continue our journey, actually, with concluding our series with the winning the battle within. Um, today's our last message in that series. Next week, we'll begin a whole different uh, series. Uh, I promise next week you will not need the tissue box or anything like that. So uh, come back next week. But uh, it's been really cool to hear the encouragement about how God has been moving in people's lives over the course of the series. And over the last few weeks, we've been taking this journey of how to fight these battles within, not only just fight them, but to begin to win the battles that we struggle with in our minds. And in week one, what we did is we talked about we just need to get honest about our stuff, honest about, remember, our insecurities, our pain, our struggles. Um, we need to get honest with God and with other people. And then week two, we looked at our story. Remember, we're great storytellers. We have these narratives that we tell ourselves. We have these conversations in our head, and based upon those conversations, it leads us to dark places. And we learn that we just need to tell ourselves a new story, and that's why we need people in our lives. Uh, we need God's word uh, to help us tell those new stories. And then last week, we looked at the importance of how we cope with our stuff. Because how we cope, well, it's kind of like quicksand. Uh, if you just keep struggling in the way you're doing it, uh, you're just going to keep going deeper and deeper. But actually, we need to do something different. And so part of that is learning how to cope God's way. And through that journey, we've been looking through the book of Psalms. And, and so encourage you, if you missed any of those messages, encourage you to go back. You can look, listen to our podcast or go to our Facebook page, and you can watch those as well. Uh, but what I want to do before I get into the meat of what I want to talk about today is I want to answer a question that I get asked a lot concerning mental illness. And it's not from the person who's struggling with mental illness. It's those who are dealing with the fact, trying to love those people who are struggling. And uh, I get asked a lot, like, how do I handle this? Like, what do I do? How do I help them? Uh, because believe it or not, um, there's more people that suffer than just the person who's struggling with a mental illness. It's those who are also loving them. And so what I want to do is I just want to give, if you're in that position where, man, I'm just trying because, again, their stuff affects me too. Are you with me, church? And so, so like, what do I do to help them? And so what I want to do is I want to just give you three simple things, three simple things. And uh, we're going to go back to get the answers to that. I want to go back uh, to the Old Testament and look at a guy named Jonathan. And he's, he's going to, because he, he was the dad or the, the son of King Saul, who we've looked at, who struggled. And then also, too, he's the friend of David, uh, who struggled with some of this stuff, too. And so here's the first thing. I want you to just take out your message notes and fill this in. If you're in this position, this is what I encourage you to do. The first thing is this. It's just to live your life. Live your life. Now, I know that statement may sound kind of harsh, but for many of us, we find that our loved one's struggles keep us from living. Like, it's all consuming for us. And if you're here today, I need, if that's you, I need you to hear something. One, you have a voice. Because I know many times, especially if it's in your home, you begin to lose your voice in the home. Because, because of the mental illness, life is revolving around them. And I get it. Many times you need to understand this too, is that you have value, that you have your own identity, because many times it just gets lost in the shuffle. You have interests <laughs> that God has given you and passions. But can I just tell you, it gets lost by the wayside because we spend all of our time being consumed by our loved one. See, life doesn't stop. Your whole life can't be revolved around just their stuff. You can make your own decisions. And as I've been praying about this uh, this week, I just felt like someone needed to hear that today, is that you can still live your life. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to abandon those people. No, we're going to love them. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute, okay? But it's okay to pursue your interests, your work, your friends. Here's what happens if you don't you will slowly die on the inside. That's why it's important. Uh, Jonathan's dad, remember if we talked about it, he struggled with insecurities. He always wanted people to love him. <laughs> it affected his decision-making. We looked at that. In fact, uh, we looked at it caused him to give in to the desires of his people, 
that he was leading rather than God. God's voice was smaller than that of the people because of his own insecurities, because he just wanted to be liked. And many of us, we struggle with that as well. And so we pick up this story because of this. Saul was always very indecisive about life. And one time, there's a part in 1 Samuel where Saul was with 600 of his men, and then there was Philistines, the enemy, all around them. And for various reasons, they only had two swords. <laughs> only two swords. Um, one was for King Saul, and one was for his son Jonathan. And so in the middle of the story, King Saul was filled with indecisiveness. If you remember, he, he had lost favor with God, and God told him, man, you're going to lose your kingship. And he was struggling. He didn't know what to do. So what does he do? He brings in this priest who wears this garment called the ephod, E-P-H-O-D. And really, it was a priestly garment that kind of represented that God was with us. And in fact, we remember, we, we looked at that God kind of took his hand off of him. So here it is. He's indecisive. He doesn't know what to do, and he knows that God isn't with him, but he's got to have people to like him. So what does he do? He brings the priest with the ephod because he's got to have the optics. Does that make sense? You with me? And so here is Jonathan. We're like, we're stuck. We're all going to die. What we're going to do? Jonathan said, you know what? I can do something. Just because Saul is stuck doesn't mean that I have to be stuck. And so we pick up the story in 1 Samuel 14, 6. It says, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf, and nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And so Jonathan takes his armor bearer, and they come up to this cliff, and there's about 20 soldiers, and he finds that God is with him. So he goes out there with one sword, uh, with his armor bearer, and he wipes out 20 men. And all of a sudden, the, ar the armies of the Philistines are start going crazy. Saul's army hears what's going on. They sense that something is happening. And so Saul's army, in the midst of indecision, well, what, what, what's going on? And so they get involved in the battle, and they win the day. Because Jonathan said, you know what? I'm not going to be stuck here. I'm not going to be stuck. Can I just tell you, church, you don't have to be stuck. It is okay to live the life that God has called you to live, even in the midst of that journey. Here's the second thing I found in the story of Jonathan, is that we can speak the truth. It's okay to speak the truth. Because many times when our loved ones are suffering, and really what we suffer from is stinking thinking. I remember I told you about my journey. Man, we just have stinking thinking. And we're afraid to say anything. You know what? It is okay to confront them about what? What we've looked at. About their honesty, about their situation about their story that they're telling themselves. It's okay to, to speak the truth about how they're coping in life. Can I just tell you that this series was not just for those who are struggling, but it's for you too. So you know how to equip those that you love, that you can speak the truth. And if you remember, Saul was always jealous of David, of King David. And look at one of the exchanges that we have between Saul and Jonathan about David. It says this in 1 Samuel 20. It says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I love the NIV. It kind of has the PG version of that, okay? Uh, and he says this, Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse and to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? Like, he is putting on the guilt trip. Have you ever had that? Like they're putting on the guilt. He's laying it on thick. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. Again, Saul's telling himself a story. And you know what he's doing? He's using guilt and all that to control his son, manipulate his son. Look, look what Jonathan says. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? He spoke the truth. He says, Dad, you're wrong. That's not how it goes. The story yourself, <laughs> the story you're telling yourself isn't right. You know what? We need to, sometimes it's okay to stand up and say, you know what? The, hey, I love you, but the story you're telling yourself just isn't true. Now, you need to hear this. In our first message, we talked about these the mental illnesses and stuff. If we don't handle them the right way, they're progressive and the longer you wait to tell someone the truth, the harder it gets. 
That's why it is okay. I, I challenge you, church, to the people that you love, it is okay to speak the truth. So what do we do? We live our life. It's okay. We speak the truth. But here's the last one. We still stay beside them. We still stay beside them. We don't let them go. Now, there may be boundaries, the people that, you know, manipulate us and guilt us and all that, that we need to put up, okay, some boundaries, but we don't let them go. I am here for you. And even though Jonathan challenged his dad, he, he made his own decisions, he lived his life, he never gave up on his dad. In fact, he was with him till the very end. We see in Scripture in 1 Samuel 31, it says, The Philistines were hot in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, <clears throat> and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. See, in this passage, you've got to understand, Jonathan could have left his dad and gone with David. He could have. He could have abandoned his dad. He could have abandoned, his, his, abandoned Saul. But you know what? He was with him to the end of the line. He never gave up. Now, obviously, if you're in that situation, I know it sometimes it's tough. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Church, if someone's mental illness is causing you to be unsafe, you need to get help. Okay? You hear me? You with me? But, it, but for the rest of us, we need to stay beside them. We need to love them. We need to tell them the truth. But yet, you know what? It's still okay to live your life. Are you with me, church? All right, I want to, I want to make sure that I shared that with you uh, from the other uh, angle. Now, today, what I want to do the rest of the chapter of this journey, <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about this issue of joy. I want to talk about joy for a moment. And for many of us who struggle with the battle within, joy can just seem so far away. That like many of us, and let's just, this is where it starts. Like we, we forget to have fun. Like the things that we used to do and have joy and have fun in, we just don't like to do anymore. We, we, we don't. We feel like Saul, stuck. Ever felt stuck? So today what I want to do is I want to unlock the bottleneck that's keeping you from experiencing joy. And for many of us, we've been depressed or, you know, been struggling, and you've heard the rest of our messages that we've done, and you're like, I'm trying, it's so hard, I just can't see the way forward. I mean, I just can't. I'm just trying just to get through the day. And if that's you, this message is for you. But also, too, maybe you haven't experienced that, what we're talking about, mental illnesses and all those battles, but for whatever reason, you've lost your joy. You've lost your joy. This message is for you too. And so today what I want to do is I'm going to look at a couple of psalms. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, psalms. We've taken a look at several of them, specifically the ones that David uh, wrote. And if, if you get time, I'm encouraging you in your quiet time, when you, when you spend time with God, read the book of psalms. It's so rich. But the first one I want to look at that really is going to help us deal with this topic today um, is not one that David wrote. Um, in fact, this psalm, the the scholars believe it was written after David, after his son Solomon. And in fact, it's the story of the exiles. When the people of Israel, they were overtaken by a foreign government. They were exiled out of their land, but they began to come back. And at this time, this is when this was written. And life was hard for Israel, but life was beginning to come back. And so what this psalm is, it's a picture of health, of joy returning. And it's in Psalm 126. I want to look at this for a second. It says this, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with, what does it say? Joy. Restore our for fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. And so with this, it's a picture where life is back, <laughs> where my joy is back. And for many of us, we long for that. Anybody long for that? Like, I long for joy in my life. I want my joy back. So then what happens in the next couple of verses, the psalmist really goes back and gives us advice. Gives us advice. And listen, they're in position to give the advice. 
because of what they've been through. Watch what it says. It says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. That those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Now, this is actually a picture of what we've been talking about over the last three weeks, and it's this. I want you to fill this in. That joy is sown. That joy is sown. And it's a beautiful picture of that. See, joy doesn't just come out of nowhere. Joy, it's not a, a thing of circumstance. It's not when our circumstances get better. It's different than just happiness. That we can actually make decisions now and sow those decisions now, and they will reap joy for us later, joy in the future. That if we learn to sow joy, that we will reap joy. And that's why we are to what? Be honest, right? Challenge our stories, learn how to cope. Those all in action sow joy. That sowing is work. And here's the problem. When we're feeling low and we're struggling, we don't want to sow joy. Because sowing joy is hard. And so with the rest of my time, what I want to do is I want to speak into this. Like, what is the road back? Like, I mean, I just don't have any joy. I'm struggling. I just, maybe I'm just having a hard time getting out of bed. I'm not finding life in anything. How do I bring life to my bones again? Now, I've debated about this starting off this series this way, but what I wanted to do was I want to do this at the end because I want to pull together some of those things that we have learned and, and help, help us take next steps so that joy can return. You interested? Are you with me? All right. Okay, so the road back. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Psalm 16. I love how God's done this. He, he, he puts these in place for us can't make this up, okay? Psalm 16, uh, we're going to look back, the road back, the starting place. For many of us, it's the starting place to getting life back again in our bones. And here's the first one that we're going to find in this psalm that David wrote. It's this, number one, is that we need to draw a line in the sand, figuratively. And look what, look what David says. He says, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So like some of us, we've got to make the decision, am I going to pursue God or not? Like we're just towing the line with this. Am I going to go all in with God or not? Like I've given him a part of my world, but not all of my world. Or maybe I'm just mad at God. And many of us, when we're in a low place, let's just be honest, we're just mad. God, how could you allow this? And we're struggling. We keep God at a distance. And we've got to make up our mind, am I going to go all in or not? So you're going to have a hard time moving forward sowing joy if you don't just draw the line in the sand and say, you know what? I'm going to go after God with my whole heart. It's going to be hard because God is the author of joy. It says this in Psalm 30. It says, hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. This is David. Lord, be my, what does it say? Be my help. You turn my, my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, okay? That my heart may sing your praises and not be silenced. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. I love that, that I will praise you forever. We're going we're to come back to that. Lord, you are going to be the one to bring life to my bones. And we've got to make up our mind. Are we going to go all in or not? And here's the next one, is this, is we've got to find those who can help. Find those that can help. Look what David says. He says, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. In fact, if you want to, write, underline that. All my delight. But those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. That I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods as sacrifices or take up their names on my lips. Like David is saying, I'm going to delight in people who are going in the same direction I am. And those things that are holding me back, I am not going to have anything to do with that anymore. 
that I need to find help, the people who are going the same direction that is I, I am. I'm not going to participate with people who are going to continue to drag me down in that stuff. And many of us think, you know what, all this low stuff when I'm depressed or I'm anxious and all that, I can take care of it myself. You've heard me say many times, life isn't a do-it-yourself project. It's not. That's why I need help because I can't do it myself. That's why we talked about being honest, that we need to get help. So some of us, we need to talk to our people in our small group. Maybe we need to get into one. Some of us, maybe we need to go to a counselor and get some help, those that can help us. Maybe we need to go to our doctor, our physician. They can help us as well. And it's okay. They've got access to resources, whether it's medication or whatever, to help us. And it's okay. We need help. God uses all kinds of people, okay, in our lives. But here's the thing. We've got to be intentional. It's just not going to be just magically happen. And so if we're struggling with our joy, to sow joy in our life, we've got to find people who can help bring life to our bones. Here's the next one. We need to seek contentment and security in him. I love what he says here in 5 and 6. It says in Psalm 16, it says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot, what does it say? Secure. You make me secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. It's really a picture of, (sighs) and it's through him. It's with him. This is actually, this verse is actually talking about how we cope, how we cope. God, I'm anxious. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run to you because you're my portion. You're my cup. You make my lot secure. I'm not going to escape to things that I shouldn't. I'm not going to try to control the situation. I'm going to trust you. Actually, church, that's why I unapologetically ask you to invest in your relationship with God. Learn how to spend time with him. In fact, again, we have growth track next week. You come next week, and I'll show you how to spend time with God, how to strengthen your frame through spending time with God. Let me show you. In Psalm 94, 19, David says this, When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me what? Joy. Joy. Now, whose consolation? God's consolation. What's consolation? It's comfort. Like, God, your comfort brought me joy. It's in his presence. It's getting our security with him. And for many of us, what we do is we escape and we run. I'm insecure, so you know what I do? Instead of running to God, I find I want to get in the arms of someone else. I'm not good on the inside, so I've got to make someone else fill that void in my life. And somehow someone else is going to change that. Maybe we do it in in things. We, we invest in things to fill that void, but it only can be filled. And God created that in your life. That spot in your soul can only be filled by God himself. That's why we need to seek our contentment, our security in him. Here's the next one. We've got to be willing to receive instruction, like be teachable. And can I just tell you, this is really hard. We've talked throughout the series, you, you can't trust you. When you're in that point, you can't trust you. But yet, we're the expert on us, and so many times we just don't want to listen to anyone. Hey, I think you should consider this. No, I don't think so. I got it. Or, I think you're struggling. I think you have a problem. No, I got it. I got it. No, we've got to be teachable. It says this in Psalm 16, 7, 8. It says, I will praise the Lord who what? Counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. That I've got to be willing to listen to God and listen to other people who are challenging my story. Because if you ask him, and if you're willing to move and to act on what he tells you, can I just tell you, God will send you lifelines. He will. He will. He'll send people in your life to be his hands and his feet. He'll actually speak to you directly. But I just got to ask you, are you willing to move and act on it? Are we teachable? It says in Psalm 97, 11, again, just going back to the Psalms of David, light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. 
That that's why God needs to do work in my heart. That I've got to be willing to be teachable, to do the heart work so that I can be healed and be whole again. That's why I told you, get a journal. Write, start writing it down what God's doing in your heart. Even the messy that you're crying out to God, write it down and watch what God does in your heart. Let him do the heart work. Be teachable before him. And here's the fifth one, is that we've got to find what is good each day. Got to find what is good each day. Watch this. In Psalm 16, 19, 9 through 10, it says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, that my body will also rest secure, because why? You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. That like David is choosing joy. Like he's practicing it. He's challenging his story. He's telling a different one. No, I'm going to be okay because God, you're not going to abandon me. I'm going to be okay. That what we do is we're going to make, we're going to take steps. Now, many times I'll talk with people who are, who are suffering and they'll, and they'll, and they'll say, I'll say, how's your day going? Eh, it's okay. And you know what I do? <laughs> Woohoo! Yes! Because it's not stinky. Because last week it was stinky. And you're going through a hard time. And you know what? Today's a good day. Why? Because you're just okay. It's better than you were in the past. And you know what? We've got to find the good in that. Find the joy in that. Because you know what? Joy is sown one attitude at a time, one decision at a time, one statement out of your mouth at a time. We're going to sow joy. We're going to celebrate that today was actually a little bit better than yesterday, that we're in those places. You know what? We're going to take two steps forward, one step back. The next day, it might be two steps forwards and three steps back. But you know what? We're going forward, and we're going to find the good in the day. We're going to find good in that. You with me, church? We're going to anchor ourselves. In fact, we looked at, remember, Philippians chapter 4, when Paul tells us, you know, he tells us to look at our story. Finally, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, we need to think about those, think about those things. And then here's the last one. In sowing joy, we need to pursue his presence. We need to pursue his presence. Look what it says in verse 11. It says, you make known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with what? Joy where? In your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. Can I just tell you, like, you can be in the same room with someone and not be there. You're been at dinner or something like that, and you're like, everybody's on their phone. Like, you're in the same room, but you're not connected with them. I remember there's plenty of times where I've been at the dinner table. My wife's like, hey, we're here. We're here. You paying attention? You know, we're right here, right here. Can I just tell you, I know the theology that when we receive God as our Lord and Savior, God is with us. We have his Holy Spirit with us. I get it. But you know what? You can be in the same room as God, and he's there, but you ain't. You're not. You're not engaging with God. And David takes this psalm, and he says, you know what? Joy is found in your presence. I need to engage with that. Look what it says in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with what? All of your heart. That when we're in the presence of God, that, that, that is a choice. That we have to seek that out. And when we do that, joy is found there. In fact, one of the greatest ways that we do this is through worship. That worship unlocks so many doors in our soul. Actually, God's word tells us that he inhabits the praises of his people. It's like when God's people praise him, it's like he shows up. And why is that? Can I just, can I just tell you? There's just this connection that happens when we make much of God. Like, <laughs> I could say, you know what? You need to get, I, t I tell the story of this at, 
at Growth Track. You know what? This guy Jason over here, you need to get to know him. He's an awesome dad. He's an awesome teacher. Man, he's just a home run person. Awesome husband. And you know what? Either one of two things is going to happen. One, uh, I'm going to I'm going to freak out Jason. It's like he's going to think I'm a stalker or something like that. Or otherwise, you know what? He's going to want to be by me because you know what? I'm speaking life into him. He wants to be around people. You want to be around people who think much of you. And can I just say there's just something that happens that God just seems to show up when we make much of him. And just on the opposite of that, when we make much of God, God becomes bigger and our stuff becomes smaller. And you don't have to do that just here on Sundays. You can praise God every day in your car, in your home, at your work, and even here. That I was called practicing the presence of God. You know, that at the same time, I know he's with me, but there's a difference again when I'm tuned into it and when I'm not. And so I go out with an attitude of prayer and praising God. God, you're awesome. Thank you so much for what you're doing in my life. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you. And you know what helps me to find the good in the day? You know what? He dwells with me, and his Holy Spirit just seems to move in my life. And all of a sudden, joy is sown. Joy is sown. And for many of us in our life, we've never done that. We come on Sunday mornings and people are like, they're clapping. And they're like, man, they're weird. They have found joy in the presence of their Lord. And you don't have to do all that stuff to do. But you know what? Your heart needs to sow joy. God, you're big. You're so much bigger than my stuff. Um, I, at the football games on Friday night if you're around me at the football games and you've seen me you know I'm pretty boisterous in the stands okay and at first it made people kind of weird you know uh, but then as we go along and we score a touchdown I'm like whew, giving high fives all around at first people are like okay then what happens is over time, what happens is that once we score, then everybody's turning around, they're looking at me, and they got their hands up. <laughs> they're ready. Can I tell you, it's contagious. Praise is contagious. It transforms a situation. It transforms a room. It transforms a person. God moves and works. So here's what we're going to do. We started this series. Uh, if you remember, we had a cross up here. And I asked you to come, and I asked you to kind of be honest with your stuff, and we did that. And so just as we started our series with an expression of God, I'm going to be honest, we're going to close this series with a different expression. And it's this, God, you're bigger than my stuff. That Jesus, you are all that I need. And I declare my dependence on you. And you alone are going to be my source of joy. That I'm going to find my contentment in you. That Jesus, I turn to you in everything. And we're going to do that through an expression of worship. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're not going to take our offering right yet now. Okay, so all of our ushers just hang still. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And I'm going to ask you right now, just in the quietness of this moment, to declare your dependence on him. To tell him how good he is. Ask him to become bigger and the things of this world to become smaller. Lift up your hearts, lift up your voices to him as our team leads.